Hello, my name's Bruce Guerin, and I'm the director of Personhood Kansas. I'm a lifelong Kansas resident and spent my early years in Oskaloosa, Kansas. That's where I grew up in the northeast part of the state. My wife, Marsha, and I have been married for 49 years. We have two sons and six grandsons. And today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our plans to amend the state constitution in the state of Kansas. I don't remember exactly when I learned this, but uh, I think it was in Mr. Bateman's science class in 1960, and that's where I learned about conception for the first time. Now, that was a long time ago, and I may be mistaken, but I believe I remember Mr. Bateman explaining to us that uh, uh, life of the human being began at conception. Now, he said it with quite a bit of authority, and we had no reason to doubt what Mr. Bateman said. He was an honorable man and had done his homework in preparation for the class. But uh, I was a little bit surprised then when I found out that 13 years later that, the, that life beginning at conception wasn't in fact something that everybody knew. As a matter of fact, apparently Mr. Bateman was, uh, as an eighth grade science teacher, was way ahead of his time. Because as you can see, the Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman and the other seven justices that voted in favor of Roe v. Wade didn't see it that way. As a matter of fact, they went on to say that we need not resolve the difficult question of when life begins. Think about that. They thought they need not uh, resolve that difficult question. They went on to say, when those trained in respective disciplines of medicine, philosophy, and theology are unable to arrive at any consensus, the judiciary at this point in the development of man's knowledge is not in a position to speculate as to the answer. Well, I suggest that if they had talked to Mr. Bateman, they would have known the answer. Because the horrific things that have happened since that statement was made and the and, uh, Roe v. Wade has become part of the, the law of our land is hard to believe. In that time, we have, on the average, murdered 1.3 million unborn children every year. That's 3,500 every day. That's 145 every hour or two every minute. As we speak today, the lives of unborn babies are being taken across our land. Now, that total comes out to be about 60 million unborn children have died at the hands of abortionists in the United States. We get so used to large numbers, sometimes it's hard for us to imagine what 60 million looks like. But maybe it would help if you understood that that's one third of the population of the United States 44 years and younger. Now, if you're hearing my voice and you're under the age of 44, you're in a unique group of people because see, you're an abortion era survivor. One third of your generation has lost their lives to abortion. And it's really important that you understand that and that we understand that as a country, but it's still hard for us to imagine. But think of it like this. If all the people today in Montana, North Dakota, Idaho, Wyoming, South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, Utah, Colorado, Missouri, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas, yes, and even Kansas, were wiped off the face of the earth, it would be comparable to the number of lives that have been taken due to surgical abortion in America today. But what about Kansas? Yes, even in Kansas, we recognize that since 1971, over 440,000 unborn children have died, an average of 10,000 children every year. That's 28 children every day, 365 days a year for 44 years, according to the Kansas Annual Summary of Vital Statistics for 2014. Think about that for a minute. What does that really look like? Well, 28 unborn children could be represented by 28 kindergartners here in Kansas. One class of kindergartners murdered every day. Remember when Sandy Hook happened? 
in that terrible event, 26 young people, those children were murdered. Our country was astounded, was shocked, was amazed. But that happens in Kansas every day. More, even more strange is the idea that it's against the law to kill an unborn child in Kansas if it was part of the commission of a crime. 34 states have that law on the books and it's considered first degree murder if that baby dies in the commission of a crime. So what, what's the distinction between that baby and a baby that's aborted the same day? Well the distinction is one is wanted and one isn't wanted. And the true difference is whether or not the child is wanted. If it's wanted, it's first degree murder. If it isn't wanted, well, I guess we think it's okay. I don't know how many of you are familiar with why we call our effort personhood, because even the amendment we have doesn't have personhood in it. But the idea behind personhood really came out of the Supreme Court. And I want you to listen to this. Still number 70, 18, a row against Wade. You would agree, I suppose, that one of the important factors that has to be considered in this case is what rights, if any, does the unborn fetus have? That's correct. Yes. And the basic constitutional question initially is whether or not an unborn fetus is a person, yes. isn't it? That's it's critical to this case. Yes, sir. It is. If it were established that an unborn fetus is a person within the protection of the 14th Amendment, you would have almost an impossible case here. Would I not? would have a very difficult case. You certainly would. Could Texas constitutionally, in your view, uh, declare that by statute that uh, uh, a fetus is a person for all constitutional purposes? The state cases. could obviously adopt that kind of statute, and then the question would have to be adjudicated. If it were established that an unborn fetus is a person within the protection of the 14th Amendment, you would have almost an impossible case. It's an impossible case. It's an impossible case. It's an impossible case. So our effort is to focus on passing a constitutional amendment that recognizes the rights of unborn children to protect all human beings from their very biological beginning. Efforts at the national level have failed over the years. And so what we really want to try to do is recognize the opportunity to respect life in Kansas the way we believe the Founding Fathers expected us to. So uh, uh, House Concurrent Resolution 5018, uh, among other things, says the state of Kansas shall guarantee the inalienable rights, equal protection, and due process of the law of every human being from the beginning of the biological development of that human being, including fertilization. That's our goal. So when we say inalienable rights, what, what are we referring to? We're talking about God-given rights granted to us by the Constitution that cannot be taken away. Some refer to it as natural rights. We know it as rights given to all human beings because they are, in fact, created in the image of God and for his good purpose. What we want to be able to do is reestablish for the unborn child those inalienable rights that you and I take for granted. In addition, we want to provide for all human beings but especially for the unborn, equal protection. What that says is, is that unborn children shouldn't be treated different than any other human being, just like the other guarantees that we have of respecting a person because of who they are, not because of a particular group they belong to or the color of their skin. And finally, due process. We want to guarantee a course of judicial uh, proceedings that are designed to protect the unborn children just like you and I are able to enjoy today in Kansas. So, you might ask the question, Bruce, has anybody ever passed this before? No, it hasn't been passed in any of the states and efforts have been made to do that. Uh, Mississippi and Colorado both have tried to pass personhood amendments, but they have failed. So you might ask me, so what makes you think we can pass them in Kansas? 
Well, I guess because I think Kansas is different. Back in 1970, I finished my duty in the Marine Corps and my wife and I were living in California. And because we were footloose and fancy free, we began to talk about where did we want to live. We lived in California for a while and in Virginia, found those people to be perfectly nice people. And of course we had some family in Kansas, but we decided on Kansas because we thought based on our experience, Kansas people were different. We thought they were a different kind of people, a people that we wanted to be associated with and had strong moral values. So we headed home. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Underground Railroad, but I bring it up today so that you can see that Kansas has a history of being involved, supporting the underdog, even if it means getting out of their comfort zone. You see, Kansas is called Bleeding Kansas because of all the battles that went on during slavery time. As a matter of fact, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 suggested that states could decide whether they were going to be slave or free. And Kansas came into existence in that particular environment, providing an escape through the Underground Railroad for slaves coming out of the South was a common activity in Kansas, especially up in the northeast part of the state where I'm from. But you need to understand that doing so put the people who supported the slaves leaving that part of the country in serious jeopardy because of the slave law, the fugitive slave law of 1850, which meant that if you were found helping a slave leave the South in states where slavery was legal, you could be fined and go to jail. But it didn't keep Kansans from getting involved in that process. They were willing to step out of their comfort zones and support what they knew to be right, and they did that. I don't know how many of you know where Wabunsee, Kansas is, but it's not too far from Manhattan, as a matter of fact. And the church there in Wabunsee has the title Beecher Bible and Rifle Church. I don't suspect any of you have ever been to a church that was called Rifle Church. But this, this was a church that was founded by a Connecticut church that wanted to come to Kansas and support the efforts in Kansas to come about as a free state. Well, they knew they had to move all their belongings to Kansas through slave states, and so some of the crates they had said Bibles on them, but in fact, there were rifles inside because they were so committed to the cause of, of Kansas being free. This particular church uh, uh, was uh, uh, established in Wabunsee, Kansas, and if you go there in the summertime, you can still worship there. Have you ever heard of the uh, Kansas Orphan Train? Well, the Orphan Train didn't just come to Kansas, but from 1857 to 1930, between five and 6,000 orphans came from the East Coast and took up residence in Kansas in families that took them in, cared for them, and provided for them. You might even find out, if you looked at your ancestry, that you may even have some orphans in your family background because many of them were adopted by the families and ultimately cared for. They inherited property. And that all happened because the heart of the people in Kansas wanted to reach out and help those who couldn't help themselves. People willing to get out of their comfort zone and make these orphans part of their family. In farms all across Kansas, these trains would arrive and people would come forward and take these young children on. So, are we, are we like them? Are we like the Kansans that took in children from the orphan train? Are we like Kansans that would jeopardize our freedom to make sure that slaves had theirs? Yeah, that's really the question, isn't it? Aren't we at a point in Kansas where justice for the unborn has been denied too long? Isn't it time for us to step up like our heritage shows us to, to be the kind of people that are ready to fight the good fight and, and make the changes necessary in our state 
regardless of whatever the states think. So how do we go about doing that? Well, one of the things we've been doing for many years is passing laws. And laws is a way to do it. Laws have been passed for many years now trying to restrict, control, and regulate abortion. What we're talking about is not a law. It's an amendment to the state constitution. And the process is very much different. In the case of a law, a law is debated, considered, written up, and approved by the House and the Senate of Kansas, goes on to the governor for his signature, and with his signature becomes the law of the land. Amendments aren't the same. The founding fathers of Kansas decided they wanted to handle amendments differently. So the way they set it up is, is that if you want to amend the Constitution, and you can get two-thirds of the House of Representatives and two-thirds of the Senate to allow it to be put on the ballot, a simple majority of the Kansans voting at that particular election can bring about an amendment to the Constitution. And that's what we're shooting for. So, in the short term, it goes like this. A legislator or a group of legislators propose an amendment. It goes to either the House or the Senate first. A subcommittee looks at it and votes on it. If they, if they vote in favor, it goes to the House of the Whole. If it passes there, it then goes to a Senate committee. If it passes the Senate committee, then it goes to the Senate as the whole. If it passes there, then it appears on the very next ballot. This is a list of the different co-sponsors that have signed on to say they'd like to co-sponsor Amendment 5018. You may know some of them. I'm not going to read off all their names, but they are legislators in the House of Representatives from all across Kansas that believe you deserve the opportunity to vote on this amendment. Down in the lower, uh, next to the last person, is uh, uh, Joe Seiward. I don't know how many of you know Joe, but Joe Seiward runs a farm out near Pretty Prairie, and he was one of the legislators that I went out and visited with. When I got to his house, he invited me in and offered me a cup of coffee, and as I explained about the amendment and what we were trying to do, before I, I finished my pitch, Joe says, give me that, I'm going to sign it. I want to be a co-sponsor for that. He said, Joe, you're the easiest sell I've had so far. Why do you want to sign that? He said, you know, Bruce, I'm all about making decisions about roads and taxes and livestock and all kinds of decisions. But when it comes to life and death decisions, I think the people of Kansas deserve a right to speak. I believe Joe's right. I believe the people of Kansas deserve to have the right to speak on this issue. The group of people that you're looking at now are the people that are part of the House, Fed, and State Affairs Committee. That's the committee that this particular amendment has been assigned to and that we're going to be approaching to see if we can get some committee hearings from. So these are the fine people that have been selected to look at the amendment and to consider it and consider passing it on. And we're hoping that we'll have hearings with them soon. So simply put, your senator and your House of Representative legislator do not have to agree with the amendment. They just have to agree that you should have the right to vote on it. And that's what we're going to be asking them to do. Now, I want you to understand something. We've been in this fight for nearly 44 years, and we've made some headway. We've, we've helped people understand what abortion is, and some good things have happened. But I can tell you now, based on my experience for the last 20 years, that we aren't going to be able to do this, end abortion in Kansas, unless each and every one of us get personally involved. If you're sitting there waiting, waiting for some pro-life organization to bring this about, I'm afraid it's not going to happen. We're going to have to speak to people, talk to people, connect with people that we know, legislators, lawmakers of all kinds, anybody that we can get to listen to us, and tell them that we'd like to have the legislature provide us the opportunity to connect. We need 83 members of the House of Representatives, 27 members of the Senate, in order to accomplish this goal. So what we'd like for you to do is to help us accomplish that. 
There is a way you can go out on the internet on kansaslegislature.org. If you don't know who your legislature, you can find out who they are. You can find out what their phone number is, their email address, both at home and in Topeka, and contact them. And even if your legislature is already a co-sponsor, you do him a world or her a world of good if you called him up and said, boy, I was glad to see you on that list. We really need to do something about that. In addition, there are lots of other things you can do. Probably the most important thing you could do is pray. Pray to our God that this will end in our lifetime. Pray that we will respect him and the life he's given to all of us enough to stand the course. Also, to share what you've learned today, some of the things that have been shared. You can schedule me or any one of the members of the board to speak, to answer questions. You can call us at any time. This is what we do. And you can collect petition signatures. Now, Kansas isn't a petition state. Some states, enough signatures will get a, an amendment on the ballot. That's not how Kansas works. But we've been collecting signatures for the last few years, and we have signatures of over 7,000 Kansans who would like the opportunity to vote on this amendment. Also, we'd like for you to talk to your pastor or your priest and explain what we're trying to do and accomplish. And if you want to arrange a meeting for me to come and discuss this with them or anybody else, I'd like to do that. You can go out on Facebook and find per Personhood Kansas and like us there. And if you want to get copies of the petition or any other information about personhood, you can go to our uh, uh, personhoodkansas.com and all of this is available out there. The truth of it is that abortion in Kansas will not end until you if you're hearing my voice, until you get involved personally. There's been two generations grew up in this country and in this state with abortion on the band as being an acceptable norm. We can't do that. The longer abortion goes without a remedy, without an end, the more acceptable it comes to our culture. And it's gone on way too long. Some of you may ask the question, well, I see that when you talk about it, you talk about it without exception. And many of the pro-life organizations in the state want to suggest that, except in the case of rape or the life of the mother. Well, you understand the unborn child in both of those cases has the same value as those that were conceived in any other way. But let's talk about that for a minute. We know that rape is a terrible thing, and, and we empathize and sympathize with any woman that's had experienced that. But we believe it's wrong for the baby to be punished for the crimes of the father. And so even in the case of rape, the child can be put up for adoption, and we need to provide the most comfortable environment possible for the woman to be able to carry the baby full term. This is a group of people that have had their picture taken, all that have one thing in common. They were all conceived in rape, and their mothers carried them full term. Do you think they're happy to be alive? Do you think they respect and love what their mother did for them? Sure they did. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Rebecca Kiesling, but, but she's a, a lady I had the opportunity to meet who also was conceived in rape. And she has some good things to say, some, some informative things. We've all heard someone say, I'm pro-life, well, except in the case of rape or I'm pro-choice, especially in the case of rape. Well, to say that, you're really saying to those people whose picture you saw a moment ago that we kind of wish they'd died. We kind of wish they'd lost their life to abortion. And we know that's not what the Lord would have us to do. Further, and some of you are too young to remember, but C. Everett Koop used to be the Surgeon General of the United States of America. And more than that, he was a pediatric surgeon that had delivered literally tens of thousands of babies, many of them in tough situations. And he stated before Congress, in my 36 years as a pediatric surgeon, I've never known of one instance where the child had to be aborted to save the mother's life. Yes, there are times when the child is lost. There's no doubt about it. But let me tell you what abortion means. Abortion means intentionally killing the child. That's not what we're talking about.
We're not talking about intentionally killing the child. We're talking about that sometimes the child's life is lost. But that's not abortion, and don't let anybody convince you of it. It's really important that as we move forward, we understand the environment we're in and the support where we have that support. Rebecca said, God is not going to honor mediocrity and compromise when it comes to the slaughter of innocent children whom he created. Really, that's the issue here. I spoke to someone recently and, and explained to them that although we have to go through the House and Senate and we're trying to amend the Constitution, this isn't a political issue at all. What we really want to do is put it in the hands of the people of Kansas, the churches, and allow the people of Kansas to voice their opinion about this horrendous thing. One of my favorite scriptures is from Proverbs, and it says, Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards the slaughter. It goes on to say, God knows our hearts, and he knows that's what he's called us to do. In Matthew 25, 40, in that particular script area of scripture of the goats and the sheep, where Jesus is the judge, he says, Jesus, the king will reply, tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Do you want to know who the least is in our culture today? It's the baby that died today right here in our city. That's who the least is. They weren't able to speak. They weren't able to defend themselves. They had no voice. And they're the least. Finally, in Ephesians 5.11, it says, We have nothing to do with the evil deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. We're that light. And it's our job to make it visible. Rebecca said, We've been stuck in the desert for nearly 40 years. Actually, we've been there longer now. I'm tired of those who are afraid of the giants in the land. Chipping away at abortion has not brought us any closer to ending abortion in our nation. We have a unique opportunity. I've been asked on different occasions how I happened to get involved in abortion and, and why I've spent the last 25 years trying to see if I couldn't get it ended. Well, one particular day, I happened to be at the local abortion clinic. And I was praying, facing the building. And I glanced down at my feet. I opened my eyes while I was praying. And I noticed my shoes. I noticed that they were dusty. Well, I didn't know why they would be like that. Having been in the Marine Corps, I usually kept them pretty shiny. So I reached down and I flicked the dust off my shoes and I discovered it wasn't dust at all, it was ash. And I looked up and I saw the incinerator going full blast at the abortion clinic with the smoke coming out of the top of it. And I realized that that ash had settled on me. And as the wind blew, it settled all across the land on farms and schools and playgrounds. The ash of, of murdered babies was being spread all across our country. And then I began to think about the incinerators in Germany that killed many, many millions of people and how many people didn't do much about it. And I realized that I truly didn't want to stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ and have to explain why I didn't do anything about it. Please help and support us in our effort to end the killing in Kansas. God bless you all.